And So Did I by Isaac Jocelyn Cox, read for LibriVox.org by Gabriel Glenn. Before the fire that winter's night, none seemed so sweet as she, with winning smile and dark eyes bright and playful repartee. The dancing light as round it flashed to her seemed drawing nigh, her slender waist pressed unabashed, thus guided so did I. It softly touched her cheeks aflame, I scarce repressed a sigh. It touched her lips, dared I the same? Too tempting, so did I. Her ruby lips half pouting seemed my boldness to decry. Pa's step was heard, the flame scarce gleamed, went out, and so did I. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ariadne Waking by Lee Hunt. Poem read by Amy Graymore for LibriVox. The moist and quiet morn was scarcely breaking when Ariadne in her bower was waking. Her eyelids still were closing, and she heard, but indistinctly yet a little bird, that in the leaves o'erhead waiting the sun seemed answering another distant one. She waked but stirred not, only just to please her pillow nestling cheek while the full seas the birds, the leaves, the lulling love o'er night, the happy thought of the returning light, the sweet self-willed content conspired to keep her senses lingering in the feel of sleep. And with a little smile she seemed to say, I know my love is near me, and tis day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Arms and the Boy by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org By Winston Tharp Let the boy try along this bayonet blade How cold steel is, and keen with hunger of blood, Blue with all malice like a madman's flash, And thinly drawn with famishing for flesh. Lend him to stroke these blind, blunt bullet-heads, Which long to muzzle in the hearts of lads, Or give him cartridges of fine zinc teeth, sharp with the sharpness of grief and death for his teeth seem for laughing round an apple there lurk no claws behind his fingers supple and god will grow no talons at his heels nor antlers through the thickness of his curls end of poem this recording is in the public domain the barrier by claude mckay Read for LibriVox.org by Gabriel Glenn. The Barrier I must not gaze at them, although your eyes are dawning day. I must not watch you as you go your sun-illumined way. I hear, but I must never heed the fascinating note which, fluting like a river reed, comes from your trembling throat. I must not see upon your face love's softly glowing spark, for there's the barrier of race. You're fair, and I am dark. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The City in the Sea by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Sierra Abrams Lo, death has reared himself a throne In a strange city lying alone Far down within the dim west Where the good and the bad and the worst and the best Have gone to their eternal rest there shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours. Around, by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy rotters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on long night time of that town, but light from out the lurid sea shines up the turret silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, Up shadowy long-forgotten bowers Of sculptured ivy and stone flowers, Up many and many a marvelous shrine Where wreathed friezes intertwine, The vial, the violet, and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky Their melancholy waters lie, So blend the turrets and shadows there That all seem pendulous in air, While from a proud tower in the town Death looks gigantically down. There open fanes and gaping graves Yawn level with the luminous waves. 
but not the riches there that lie within each idol's diamond eye not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed for no ripples curl alas along that wilderness of glass no swellings tell that winds may be upon some far-off happier sea no heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene for lo a stir is in the air the wave there is a movement there as if the towers cast aside and slightly sinking the dull tide as if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmy heaven the waves have now a redder glow the hours are breathing faint and low and when amid no more earthly moans down down that tell and shall settle hence hell rising from a thousand thrones shall do it reverence end of poem this recording is in the public domain Dalitla Boy by Thomas Augustine Daly Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio November 2010 The spring is come, but oh, the joy, it is too late. He was so cold, my little boy, he no could wait. I no can count how many week how many day that he is seek how many night i sit and hold the little hand that was so cold he was so patient so oh, so sweet it hurts my throat for think of it and all he ever ask is when he's gonna come the spring again one day one bright as sunny day he see across the alleyway the little girl that's livin' there is raise her window for the air and put outside a little pot of what you call forget me not so small a flower so little a thing but still it make his heart a sing oh now at last he's come to spring the little plant is glad for no the sun is come for make it grow so too i am grow warm and strong so like a dad he sing his song but ah the night come down and then the winter is sneak back again and in the alley all the night is fall the snow so cold so white and cover up the little pot of what you call forget me not all night the little hand i hold is grow so cold so cold so cold the spring is come but oh the joy it is too late he was so cold my little boy he now could wait end of poem this recording is in the public domain in praise of tobacco by samuel rowlands Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey. In praise of tobacco, to fade on flesh is gluttony; it maketh men fat like swine. But is he not a frugal man that on a leaf can dine? He needs no linen for to foul his fingers' ends to wipe that has his kitchen in a box and roast meat in a pipe the cause wherefore few rich men's sons prove disputants in schools is that their fathers fed on flesh and they begat fat foals this fulsome fading clogs the brain and doth the stomach choke but he's a brave spark that can dine with own light dash of smoke end of poem this recording is in the public domain invictus 
by William Ernest Henley, read for LibriVox.org by Julie from Monaghan. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but a horror of the shade. And yet the manners of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lament for Thomas McDonough by Francis Ledwidge Read for LibriVox.org by Brendan McCabe He shall not hear the bittern cry in the wild sky where he is lain, nor voices of the sweeter birds above the wailing of the rain. Nor shall he know when loud march blows through slanting snows her fanfare shrill, blowing to flame the golden cup of many an upset daffodil. But when the dark cow leaves the moor and pastures poor with greedy weeds, perhaps he'll hear her low at morn lifting her horn in pleasant meads. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Orphan Annie by James Whitcomb Riley Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Jones Little Orphan Annie's come to our house to stay And wash the cups and saucers up And brush the crumbs away And shoo the chickens off the porch And dust the hearth and sweep And make the fire and bake the bread And earn her board and keep and all us other children, when the supper things is done, we set around the kitchen fire and has the mostest fun a listening to the witch tales that Annie tells about, and the goblins that gets you if you don't watch out. Once they was a little boy who wouldn't say his prayers, so when he went to bed at night away upstairs. His mammy heard him holler, and his daddy heard him bawl. And when they turned the kivers down, he wasn't there at all. And they seeked him in the rafter room, and cubby hole and press. And they seeked him up the chimbley flue, and everywheres, I guess. But all they ever found was this pants and roundabout. And the goblins'll get ya if ya don't watch out. And one time, a little girl would always laugh and grin and make fun of everyone and all her blood and kin. And once, when they was company and old folks was there, she mocked em and shocked em and said she didn't care. And this to she kicked her heels and turned to run and hide. They was two great big black things standing by her side. And they snatched her through the ceiling for she knowed what she's about. And the goblins will get ya if ya don't watch out. And little orphan Annie says, when the blazes blue and the lamp wick sputters and the wind goes woo woo and you hear the crickets quit and the moon is gray 
and the lightning bugs and dew is all squenched away, you better mind your parents and your teachers fond and dear, and cherish them it loves you and dry the orphan's tear, and help the poor and needy ones that clusters all about, or the goblins will get ya if ya don't watch out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Logicians Refuted by Jonathan Swift Read for LibriVox by Greg Marguerite Logicians have but ill-defined as rational the humankind. Reason, they say, belongs to man, but let them prove it if they can. Wise Aristotle and Smiglesius, by ratiocination specious, have strove to prove with great precision, with definition and division, homo est ratione preditum, but for my soul I cannot credit them and must, in spite of them, maintain that man and all his ways are vain, and that this boasted lord of nature is both a weak and erring creature, that instinct is a surer guide than reason boasting mortal's pride, and that brute beasts are far before em. Deus est anima brutorum. Whoever knew an honest brute? at law his neighbor prosecute, bring action for assault and battery, or friend beguile with lies and flattery. O'er plains they ramble, unconfined, no politics disturb their mind. They eat their meals and take their sport, nor know who's in or out at court. They never to the levy go, to treat as dearest friend a foe. They never importune his grace, nor ever cringe to men in place, nor undertake a dirty job, nor draw the quill to write for Bob. Fraught with invective they ne'er go, to folks at Paternoster Row. No judges, fiddlers, dancing masters, no pickpockets or poetasters are known to honest quadrupeds, no single brute his fellow leads. Brutes never meet in bloody fray, nor cut each other's throats for pay. Of beasts, it is confessed, the ape comes nearest us in human shape. Like man, he imitates each fashion, and malice is his ruling passion. But both in malice and grimaces, a courtier any ape surpasses. Behold him, humbly cringing, wait upon the minister of state. View him soon after to inferiors, aping the conduct of superiors. He promises with equal air, and to perform takes equal care. He, in his turn, finds imitators. At court the porters, lackeys, waiters, their master's manners still contract, and footmen, lords, and dukes can act. Thus at the court both great and small behave alike, for all ape all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Midsummer Noon in the Australian Forest by Charles Harper Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug, Perth, Western Australia Not a sound disturbs the air, there is quiet everywhere. Over plains and over woods, what a mighty stillness broods. All the birds and insects keep where the coolest shadows sleep. Even the busy ants are found resting in their pebbled mound. Even the locust clingeth now silent to the barky bough. Over hills and over plains, 
quiet, vast and slumberous, reigns. Only there's a drowsy humming from yon warm lagoon slow coming. Tis the dragon hornet, see! All bedaubed resplendently, yellow on a tawny ground, each rich spot nor square nor round, rudely heart-shaped, as it were, the blurred and hasty impress there of a vermeil-crusted seal, dusted o'er with golden meal. Only there's a droning where yon bright beetle shines in air, tracks it in its gleaming flight with a slanting beam of light, rising in the sunshine higher till its shards flame out like fire. Every other thing is still, save the ever-wakeful rill, whose cool murmur only throws cooler comfort round repose, or some ripple in the sea of leafy boughs, where lazily, tired summer, in her bower turning with the noontide hour, heaves a slumberous breath, ere she once more slumbers peacefully. Oh, tis easeful here to lie hidden from noon's scorching eye, in this grassy cool recess, musing thus of quietness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nightmare, a tale for an autumn evening by Amy Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. November 2010 after a print by george cruikshank it was a gusty night with the wind booming and swooping looping round corners sliding over the cobblestones whipping and fearing and careering over the roofs like a thousand clattering horses mr spruggins had been dining in the city mr spruggins was none too steady in his gait and the wind played ball with Mr. Spruggins, and laughed as it whistled past him. It rolled him along the street, with his little feet pit-a-patting on the flags of the sidewalk, and his muffler and his coat-tails blown straight out behind him. It bumped him against area railings, and chuckled in his ear when he said, Ouch! Sometimes it lifted him clear off his little patting feet, and bore him in triumph over three grey flagstones and a quarter. The moon dodged in and out of clouds, winking. It was all very unpleasant for Mr. Spruggins, and when the wind flung him hard against his own front door, it was a relief, although the breath was quite knocked out of him. The gas lamp in front of the house flared up, and the keyhole was as big as a barn door. The gas lamp flickered away to a sputtering blue star, and the keyhole went out with it such a stabbing and jabbing and sticking and picking and poking and pushing and prying with that key and there is no denying that mr spruggins rapped out an oath or two rub-a-dub-dubbing them out to a real snare-drum roll but the door opened at last and mr spruggins blew through it into his own hall and slammed the door to so hard that the knocker banged five times before it stopped Mr. Spruggins struck a light and lit a candle, and all the time the moon winked at him through the window. "'Why couldn't you find the keyhole, Spruggins?' taunted the wind. "'I can find the keyhole.' And the wind, thin as a wire, darted in and seized the candle flame and knocked it over to one side and pummeled it down, down, down. But Mr. Spruggins held the candle so close that it singed his chin, and ran and stumbled up the stairs in a surprisingly agile manner. For the wind through the keyhole kept saying, Spruggins! Spruggins! behind him. The fire in his bedroom burned brightly. The room with its crimson bed and window curtains was as red and glowing as a carbuncle. It was still and warm. There was no wind here, for the windows were fastened, and no moon, for the curtains were drawn. The candle flame stood up like a pointed pear in a wide brass dish. Mr. Spruggins sighed with content. He was safe at home. The fire glowed, red and yellow roses, in the black basket of the grate, and the bed with its crimson hangings seemed a great peony 
wide-opened and placid. Mr. Spruggins slipped off his topcoat and his muffler. He slipped off his bottle-green coat and his flowered waistcoat. He put on a flannel dressing-gown and tied a peaked nightcap under his chin. He wound his large gold watch and placed it under his pillow. Then he tiptoed over to the window and pulled back the curtain. There was the moon dodging in and out of the clouds, but behind him was his quiet candle. There was the wind whisking along the street. The window rattled, but it was fastened. Did the wind say, Spruggins? All Mr. Spruggins heard was, Sss, dying away down the street. He dropped the curtain and got into bed. Martha had been in the last thing with the warming pan. The bed was warm, and Mr. Spruggins sank into feathers with the familiar ticking of his watch just under his head. Mr. Spruggins dozed. He had forgotten to put out the candle, but it did not make much difference, as the fire was so bright. Too bright! The red and yellow roses pricked his eyelids. They scorched him back to consciousness. He tried to shift his position. He could not move. Something weighed him down. He could not breathe. He was gasping, pinned down, and suffocating. He opened his eyes. The curtains of the window were flung back. The fire and the candle were out, and the room was filled with green moonlight, and pressed against the window-pane was a wide, round face, winking, winking, solemnly dropping one eyelid after the other. Tick-tock went the watch under his pillow. Wink, wink went the face at the window. It was not the fire-roses which had pricked him. It was the winking eyes. Mr. Spruggins tried to bounce up. He could not, because— His heart flapped up into his mouth and fell back dead. On his chest was a fat pink pig. On the pig, a blackamoor, with a ten-pound weight for a cap. His mustachios kept curling up and down like angry snakes, and his eyes rolled round and round, with the pupils coming into sight and disappearing, and appearing again on the other side. The holsters at his saddle-bow were two port-bottles, and a curved table-knife hung at his belt for a scimitar, while a fork and a keg of spirits were strapped to the saddle behind. He dug his spurs into the pig, which trampled and snorted, and stamped its cloven feet deeper into Mr. Spruggins. Then the green light on the floor began to undulate. It heaved and hollowed. It rose like a tide, sea-green, full of claws and scales and wriggles. The air above his bed began to move. It weighed over him in a mass of draggled feathers not one lifted to stir the air. They drooped and dripped with a smell of port wine and brandy, closing down slowly, trickling drops on the bed-quilt. Suddenly the window fell in with a great scatter of glass, and the moon burst into the room, sizzling, Spruggins! Spruggins! It rolled toward him, a green ball of flame with two eyes in the center, a red eye and a yellow eye, dropping their lids slowly, one after the other. Mr. Spruggins tried to scream, but the blackamoor leaped off his pig with a cry, drew his scimitar, and plunged it into Mr. Spruggins' mouth. Mr. Spruggins got up in the cold dawn and remade the fire. Then he crept back to bed by the light which seeped in under the window curtains, and lay there shivering, while the bells of St. George the Martyr chimed the quarter after seven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Most. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, 
stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Around the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. A Pair of Lovers in the Street by Arthur Adams Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia A pair of lovers in the street I dare not mock With reverence meet my unforgetting heart I cheat Ah, God, spare me So soon again at the barred door to beat in vain And find their dalliance such fierce pain I, yearning up from hell's abyss, see, dreaming through their worlds of bliss, this Dante and his Beatrice. For these the distant goal have won, for which God made the plasm and sun, his patient labouring is done. For these each spring has been a bride, and lonely worlds were spawned and died, chaos for them in birth throes cried. Far out in seas of space forlorn, this crescent wave was slowly born, that thunders on the beach of morn. Are they, so soon to be meshed in, the web of splendour, silken thin, the nebulae were set to spin? Up the long path, from joy to joy, love led the way, can aught destroy the task that was the star's employ? Their ecstasy to God is more than Lucifer at heaven's door entreating pardon for his war. These two are gods, for by love's sway they have God's special task essayed, a new worlds for their gladness made. This little hour so lightly given makes earth too mean a place to live in, and broken toys is hell and heaven. All time, expectant of their bliss, hangs fearful. Space through her abyss shudders if they this hour should miss. For if their kiss they went without, the stars would be a reigning rout, and time in anguish flicker out. About God's room, from star to sun, a stealthy slippered thing would run, quenching cold tapers one by one. But they have kissed. Eternity, like a great clock, beats steadily for these mazed fools, but not for me. Of God's wide universe the strands they hold within their clinging hands, the stars march on at their commands. So from this moment blossom free new universes tirelessly, eons of unguessed ecstasy. But I can only bow and beat vain hands about God's mercy seat, and, still remembering, still entreat. Surely my penance is complete, the rack turns grimly when I meet a pair of lovers on the street. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Panther by Lee Hunt Poem read by Amy Graymore for LibriVox The panther leaped to the front of his lair, And stood with a foot up, and snuffed the air. He quivered his tongue from his panting mouth, And looked with a yearning towards the south. For he scented afar in the coming breeze News of the gums and their blossoming trees. And out of Armenia, that same day, he and his race come bounding away. Over the mountains and down to the plains, like Bacchus's panthers with wine in their veins, they came where the woods wept odorous rains, and there, with a quivering, every beast fell to his old Pamphylian feast. The people who lived not far away heard the roaring on that same day, and they said as they lay in their carpeted rooms, the panthers are come, and are drinking the gums, and some of them going with swords and spears to gather their share of the rich round tears. The panther I spoke of followed them back, and dumbly they let him tread close in the track, and lured him after them into the town, and then they let the portcullis down, and took the panther, which happened to be the largest was seen in all pamphily. By every one there was the panther admired, so fine was his shape, and so sleekly attired, and such an air, both princely and swift, he had, when giving a sudden lift, 
to his mighty paw he had turned at a sound and so stand panting and looking around as if he attended a monarch crowned and truly they wondered the more to behold about his neck a collar of gold on which was written in characters broad arsaces the king to the nician god so they tied to the collar a golden chain which made the panther a captive again and by degrees he grew fearful and still as if he had lost his lordly will but now came the spring when free-born love calls up nature in forest and grove and makes each thing leap forth and be loving and lovely and blithe as he the panther he felt the thrill of the air and he gave a leap up like that at his lair he felt the sharp sweetness more strengthen his veins ten times than ever the spicy rains and ere they're aware he has burst his chains he has burst his chains and aha he's gone and the lynx and the gazers are left alone and off to the mountains the panther's flown now what made the panther a prisoner be lo twas the spices and luxury and what set that lordly panther free twas love twas love twas no one but he end of poem this recording is in the public domain Parable of the Old Men and the Young by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp So Abram rose and clave the wood and went, and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned, both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake and said, My father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps, and builded parapets and trenches there, and stretched forth the knife to slay his son, when, lo, an angel called him out of heaven, saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns, offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not so but slew his son. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pied Beauty by Gerard Manley Hopkins Read for LibriVox.org by Brendan McCabe Glory be to God for dappled things for skies of couple colour as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pierced, fold, fallow, and plough, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. With swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 20 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey A woman's face with nature's own hand painted Hast thou the master mistress of my passion a woman's gentle heart but not acquainted with shifting change as is false women's fashion an eye more bright than theirs less false in rolling gilding the object whereupon it gazeth a man in hue all hues in his controlling which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazeth 
and for a woman wert thou first created till nature as she wrought thee fell a doting and by addition me of thee defeated by adding one thing to my purpose nothing but since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure mine be thy love and thy love's use their treasure end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet 130 by william shakespeare read for librivox.org by micah pettit my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun coral is far more red than her lips red if snow be white why then her breasts are dun if hairs be wires black wires grow on her head i have seen roses damasked red and white but no such roses see i in her cheeks and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks i love to hear her speak yet well i know that music hath a far more pleasing sound i grant i never saw a goddess go my mistress when she walks treads on the ground and yet by heaven i think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare end of poem this recording is in the public domain the wild honeysuckle by philip Furneaux, read for LibriVox.org by mariah fallon all librivox recordings are in the public domain the wild honeysuckle Fair flower that dost so comely grow, Hid in this silent, dull retreat, Untouched thy honeyed blossoms blow, Unseen thy little branches greet. No roving foot shall crush thee here, No busy hand provoke a tear. By nature's self in white arrayed, She bade thee shun the vulgar eye, And planted here the guardian shade, And sent soft waters murmuring by. Thus quietly thy summer goes, Thy days declining to repose. Smit with those charms that must decay, I grieve to see your future doom. They died, nor were those flowers more gay, The flowers that did in Eden bloom. Unpitying frosts and autumn's power Shall leave no vestige of this flower. From morning suns and evening dews At first thy little being came, if nothing once, you nothing lose, For when you die, you are the same. The space between is but an hour, The frail duration of a flower. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. You Are Old, Father William, by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Micah Pettit You are old, Father William, the young man said, And your hair has become very white, And yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and you have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple by the use of this ointment, one shilling a box. Allow me to sell you a couple? You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life you are old said the youth 
one would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.